you know, I really feel as an author that endings are so important. They're in fiction, they're more important even than starting strong. You've got to end well. And that goes for characters as well. And I wanted to give him a really considered, thought out ending that was exactly right for him. Welcome to our latest Book Reporter Talks to Interview, where our guest today is Jane Harper, and we're going to be talking about her latest thriller, Exiles, which is a Book Reporter Bets On selection, as well as an indie next pick for January. I had the pleasure of speaking with Jane a couple of years ago, and at the time we were juggling schedules because she was in Australia. This time she's in the States and we're actually in the same time zone, so fancy that, I can't believe it. Our book reporter reviewer, Catherine Weissman, is a huge fan of Jane's work, and she had this to say this week about Exiles. Harper is very good at casting a wide and subtle net of suspicion, and it wasn't until fewer than 100 pages from the end when the point of view temporarily shifts from Falk to that of another character that I began to suspect the truth. The way Harper gives us an insider's glimpse of a policeman's mind is one of this thriller's strong points. Figuring out what happens to Kim is not the only suspenseful aspect of the exiles. You'll also be engaged by Falk's decision about where to take his life next. Over three books, I become very fond of this smart, unpretentious fellow. And she also shared some questions that I'm going to get to later in this interview. And on that note, welcome, Jane. So nice to have you here. Thanks, Carol. And hi, It's it's so lovely to be here. Same, same time zone. I know we got to do this again yeah. sometime, you know, maybe in person. <laughs> so let's start with you telling us about The Exiles. Give us your like elevator pitch about the book. Yeah, so um, so Exiles is my fifth uh, book. It's an Australian mystery, um, like all my books are. This one, though, is the third and final uh, book, as you mentioned, featuring Aaron Falk, who is the detective who first was introduced in The Dry. Um, he's a federal investigator, um, a financial um, investigator. But in this book, in Exiles, he has gone to um, this beautiful, lush Um, small community deep in South Australia's wine country for the christening of a family friend's son. Um, The main action takes place a year after this community has been rocked by this really, you know, unsettling um, sort of tragedy where a a woman has gone missing at a busy food and wine festival um, and leaving her baby alone, safe and well, I would add very quickly, safe and well, it's not that kind of book, um, but the baby's safe and well, but alone in the pram and there's no son to mother. And for the last year, the community has been sort of trying to you know, her friends and family rebuild themselves a little bit, um, still with these lingering questions about what happened to her. Mm-hmm. And it's like, where is she? What's going on? It's one of those things because it's a small town. Everybody talks about it all the time. Like what happened to her? Where did she go? So I had not read either the dry, the dry or force of nature, but I didn't feel lost in the exiles. What do you do to ensure that readers aren't lost if this is the first book that are picking up? Because you did, I, I didn't feel like, oh, I don't know this character. I don't know what's going on. Is it a new setting or what works? Yeah, I'm so glad to hear that because I think I do I do try really hard with all the books to to make them accessible if you haven't read the backlist. Um, I think it can be really hard if an author's got a especially a long list of books to try and join their mid-series. Um, so um I always I always try really hard to make it so that you can, they are essentially standalones. Um the the first two books, The Dry and Force of Nature, have Aaron Fork in them. My third book, Lost Man, and my fourth book, The Survivors, are complete standalones. Um, and I think the key is really for me is to, um, you know, treat each one essentially as a standalone, even the ones with the recurring character of Fork. I, I, I feel like I went into this book knowing it was going to be his last one and wanting to kind of bring his personal journey to a little bit of a, a closure point um, for the readers who have followed him since the mm-hmm. since the first book but at the same time it is a standalone mystery and you know I'm, I'm delighted if you know you felt that you could you know be, be swept away by it and, and involved with it without necessarily having had to read the first two um that is exactly what I was hoping for so um thank you I'm pleased to hear that <laughs> mission accomplished mission accomplished you know and it was interesting because um I'm not going to give away what Catherine said but she's very pleased with the ending she's very pleased with where he oh, ends good. up so just good, know good. that I didn't want to give it away to people so what is him about him that you loved writing him, that you came back to him for a third book? So, yeah, it was, I think, you know, I've, I just, I love the character. Um, you know, he was, he's been with me since page one of um, my first, you know, when the dry was just an unpublished, untitled, you know, 
mess of a draft on my computer. Um, he was there with me and he's, you know, the, the, the books with him have kind of transformed my career. He, you know, he was, he was, those are the first two books I wrote and they gave me that path to becoming a professional author. So, um, you know, I feel like I owe him a lot, you know, and um, I wanted to step away for a couple of years to do the standalones because I, you know, I, I, I wanted to sort of make sure I made the right decisions around his character. And I think it's really important to be honest with yourself as an author about the, the longevity of your characters. I mean, not every character is built for a 20 book series. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you've got to kind of put aside any commercial or financial incentives to go beyond, I think, the point where, you know, that it suits the character and where you're going to really know that you're going to be able to produce those quality stories that the readers want and, and move them along and, um, and capture the readers in the same way. So uh, I spent a few years thinking about what you know what was in, in store for, for fork and um i kind i came to the sort of the place where um you know i really feel as an author that endings are so important they're in fiction they're more important even than starting strong you've got to end well and that goes for characters as well and i wanted to give him a really considered thought out ending that was exactly right for him and brought in all the things that you know, I wanted his characters and readers who've been there, you know, since the first book have, have spoken about to me um, and, you know, and give him that ending that he deserves as someone who's given me a lot as well. Oh, I love that. I love that. So did you have the ending in mind, like what the last page was going to be right from the beginning? Like, have you been noodling that for a couple of years? Yeah, I did know. So, um, yes, I do know the endings absolutely before I start writing anything really um I, I spent a long time planning and um the really early part of that planning process is thinking about the ending of the book that's almost I think about the ending before I think about the start um I'm thinking about that that end moment where the reader discovers what's really happened you mm -hmm. know it this is what's really happened and then my next question is okay so what looks like what what does it look like what what has possibly happened instead and what is confusing the issue you know um, and I'm building the kind of the structure out from there and um, it's and then you know you think what ca characters you need to tell the story and what's the setting that's going to support it and it's only quite late I sort of start to think okay well where's the point then where the reader could join this story the most interesting mm -hmm. point where the reader could, could join us here and we can all follow through on the story right through to this everything funnels through to this ending um, so yeah so for me the endings as I was saying, for the characters, for the individual stories, the endings is so, uh, probably the most important part for me. Yeah, start from the back and then go forward. <laughs> That's it, yeah. In our last interview, you talked about having to have a sense of place. You love having a sense of place. And it's something that it's sort of where you start your writing. What inspired this location? Because each location you've written about, I feel like I've been there. I feel like I've been to this town. I feel like I know these people. So what inspired this one? So for this one, um, it was a couple of things, really. Um, it was partly, um, so this one is set in, in like really a beautiful, lush wine country. It's a lovely part of Australia. You know, it's very sort of, it's a kind of place people go on holiday. It's the place where people have just like lovely lifestyles. You know, the weather's great. There's, um, uh, and, and this particular um, fictional town, this one is, has a very sort of strong, tight-knit, small town community feel as well. They're very supportive of each other, um, at, at least, you know, on a surface. Um, there's a very sort of close-knit feel about it. Um, so there's a couple of things. Partly I wanted to reunite Fork with um, his good friends, the Reiko family, who we mm -hmm. first met in The Dry. Um, they are um, originally from South Australia. So that kind of turned my head a little bit in that direction. And then the... Um, and then the wine country were, was just such a, a beautiful setting. I kind of couldn't really go past it. I, I feel the book has, you know, like any mystery has some dark elements running through it, but this book has a lot of light as well. And I really wanted a setting that kind of brought out uh, that the lightness in it as well. Mm -hmm. So bottles of wine from Australia, from this region, were definitely a part, a write-off. It's something you could write off about the writing, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. To get in the Absolutely. mood. <laughs> I have to say, this is I always go and do an on the ground research trip. And this was the most fun research trip. I me and my husband, we left out. We have two children. Uh, we left them with my parents back home and we got on a plane and we went out to the wine region and just had the best time, like going around speaking to these, you know, like these these vineyard owners and yeah, you know, had to sample the products as well to really get a sense of what was what was actually going on. So um yeah, it was a, it was such a it was such a genuine joy to kind of write about and 
like bring to the page. Yeah, I just had a blast. Now you're sitting there going, where do I want to go next? Let me think about this. This really worked out well, you know? <laughs> like you also set it up that there's a festival at the beginning. And there's a festival, there's an act, this is actually the anniversary of the festival where this woman Kim disappeared. So tell us about why a festival, because it's like a, a, the whole town comes together, but other people come in. Does it give you more suspects or why the festival? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you've you've kind of identified the the core reasons, really. I mean, partly, um, I always try and make you know make the action authentic to the um to the setting, and I mean that kind of part of um Adelaide's wine region is um is so known for its kind of food and wine. That's a huge part of it's you know it's it's sort of culture and um it's it's um industry, um and then. And and I also kind of wanted um, something that was was this sort of celebration. It's, it's an event that a lot of people in the community have really strong positive associations with. So they're very, um, they're in a certain mindset when they go there. They're very kind of trusting and open and enjoying themselves. And um, it's something that kind of traces back for a lot of them to their childhood, really. So um, there's those really strong personal connections for the characters, but also, um, yes, from a, a technical writing point of view as well, it really, um, you're looking as well for those opportunities that give you um, that kind of grey area where there's a lot of questions opened up. So you do have a lot of locals who know the ins and outs of this this you know festival and this this town really well but then you've got a lot of outsiders as well um who've come in and um are unknown quantities so um it, it was kind of the perfect mix of both the authentic setting and the practical writing aid as well yeah like going back and forth it's like i have this thing to you know be looking at but what else you know catherine our reviewer has a question about you why you write settings so well and she noticed you were born in manchester in the uk and you left there when you were eight and you went back to UK for university and toggling between living and working there in Australia. Does the distance literal and figurative conferred on this dual cultural identity make you more observant of things that make Australia unique? You're both an insider and an outsider in a way. And is there a truth there? Yeah, I think absolutely. Absolutely that's exactly kind of the benefit that I found. Um, I, I had the experience of having lived in Australia as a child and then gone back as an adult with some distance in between and be able to see things with um, with fresher eyes than I think I would have had I lived there my whole life. Um, I also had that interesting experience of remembering things one way and then seeing them as an adult another way, both with just a clearer you know, adult perspective and also, I guess, um, the, the, the changes that, you know, the, the way things change over time was a lot more clear to me having had that gap in between um and I think yeah exactly that kind of inside or outside perspective certainly helps when I wrote my first book which was a dry um since then I've actually been in Australia now for the past I think it's been, I think it's 15 years now um so I do feel like a lot more kind of much more of an insider you know my husband's Australian my children were born there so um I think if um if I'm ever gonna you know feel fully Australian you know it, it's it's happened it's happened now so um <laughs> but um yeah it, it's I think having had that experience certainly in the early books has has given me a way um hopefully a way of kind of looking at, at sort of settings and conversations to just pull out that sort of site uniqueness in a, in a certain place or mm -hmm. um, a certain community. Yeah. You know, if you had been there from eight to college years, let's just say you would have seen, you would have seen it through a child's eyes. And when you go back to a place, like even at the festival, the way the teenagers are seeing the festival as a place to ditch out and go get drunk at on, you know, the, the coast out there is very different from the people who are there that were adults who are sampling wine. It's um, mm. it's just to get drunk as opposed to just to sample. And it's a completely different experience. And you realize the kids see the town one way and everybody else sees the town a different way. Those who are coming in to visit are seeing the town, not the way the people who live there do. And I think you did a good job of giving us both ideas because Aaron's coming in, not living there, seeing things. And the people in the town are looking at each other of what happened last year. Why did this woman disappear? Absolutely, Carol. I think you've exactly hit like a really important point there. And one of the best things I love about writing this book, and really a lot of them, is the way that... Um, you know, as an author, it's really important to keep in mind that people are bringing themselves to any experience. You know, they are all seeing things different ways. Um, and that's not certainly not the way you're seeing it as an author. And it's not even the way the main character is seeing it. Everybody has 
you, 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 you said it really. I mean, the, the adults who've grown up there are seeing it one way. The teenagers are having a completely different experience of what's happened. There's kids as well who are seeing things that the adults aren't seeing. Um, there's all kinds of um, different perspectives. And that's kind of the beauty of it that you, you kind of, um, as long as you kind of bear that in mind as you're going through the book, you can, you can have these people bringing their own little unique um, views of, of the situation to, to the main character to kind of inform his thinking. Yeah, I think one of the teens, I think his name is Jack. I'm really bad with character names. So like, forgive me if I'm wrong. And he's supposed to be guarding that back entrance that actually leads out to where Kim's shoes were found. And he's like, they, they don't trust him. Like they're saying, well, did it really, like you weren't paying attention. They have no confidence that he was actually on top of his job. And he goes, no, so-and-so went and so-and-so. And he's remembering all these things, but it's almost like he's not a trusted person because he's young. If there was a mm. policeman standing there, I feel like they would have trusted whatever he saw. But in him, and he's very clear on what he saw. He's very clear on, I did not leave my position. Am I yeah, there? absolutely. And it's and it's such a and he was so it's Joel actually very, very Joel, close. Yeah, I know the one yeah. you mean, yeah. Um he um yeah, he's a really interesting character as for yeah, for that reason and um why I, I love kind of having that teenage perspective because exactly he's he's um you know, yeah, he's quite he's quite um he's quite a confusing character for Fork because he does have this you you know the the his age is working against him because he's he's saying what he he believes he's seen, but um you know at one point Fork has this conversation with him, saying you know it's it's not that people think you're lying it's just that people remember what it's like at that age and they they wouldn't have trusted themselves in that position to be as certain as you know as you seem to be and and that's what it is you know it's um it's you know you, it, again they're bringing themselves to the situation, um and um. Yeah, and this question of like who, um, yeah, who is who is more trustworthy, and 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 um, you know, you the main character, yeah, for wanting to trust people, but at the same time knowing that something's not quite right here, and there's someone or something that's not not as it seems, um, and how far can he go to to really trust this very warm group of people who are sort of embracing him in a lot of ways? Well, once again, the exiles features a sudden and mysterious death. And is this a Jane Harper signature? Because and do you start there? Because this time it seems like we're starting with wrapping up Aaron's life. But my gosh, there's always a sudden and mysterious death. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess it comes back to um, the, the that, that idea of where do you where where do you drop the reader into the story? And um, I used to be um, uh, I used to be a print journalist for 13 years before I wrote my first book. And a big part of what um, we were taught as trainee journalists was that um, you you can't expect people to read or certainly not finish your article. Um, they will get distracted. There'll be other things that grab their attention. So your job is to, to pull them in, you get them really early and then keep them gripped as long as possible. So um, I spent a long time thinking about how to open the book and then from there how to, um, you know, structure the chapters, um, you know, to keep them engaged and hopefully have that kind of one more page type feeling um as they're reading it yeah well I was definitely there I will not tell I hate to sell authors gee I whipped through it in a couple of days when they realized how long it took them to write it <laughs> nice. but I was definitely there because it's very very engaging and it is at the end of a chapter you're like well what's going to happen next and you're also seeing it through Fox eyes because I like him do not live in that town so I felt mm. like the reader was more like him as a character because all these other people knew each other. They had history or whatever. And I was seeing it through his eyes because I was coming to the town and visiting as well. So I was, you know, not, not that, you know, place. The other character I really love is Zara. And she is the one whose mom has disappeared and she's ardent about finding her. Now you're the mom of two young children. What did you enjoy about writing teenage Zara? Yeah, I mean, I love the teenagers in this book. And I think, you know, absolutely kind of my own motherhood tends to um, come in, go into my books. Um, I mean, my first book um, came out the same year as my first child was born, um, which was 2016. And so my experience as an author and as a mother completely overlap. Like I don't have any experience of one without the other. Um, so I, you know, immediately, you know, you've got sort of a, a you know, a woman going missing, my, my first thoughts immediately go to kind of her family and the people left behind and, and what, what their reaction is going to be. Um, and Kim is the missing woman is, is was sort of um, interesting because she does have, she has this teenage girl 
um, by her former partner and then she has a baby by her new husband. And um, so these children both are having different experiences of this. But the teenagers are so fun. So Zara and Joel, they, um, they've both kind of undergone this sort of tragedy in their own ways at a young age. And so they've, this has kind of forged this friendship, but also this kind of, amateur sleuthing you know where they they they're so so desperate for answers and they're so much um that they're much less willing to let it go than the adults are the adults aren't that willing to let it go but the adults have a more I think realistic perspective of you know um there's some things just you sometimes you don't have answers in life but the teenagers are determined to kind of find out exactly what's happening there and they they're coming up with their own theories and they're doing their own little kind of investigations at times and um it was, um, you know, and it was a lot of fun, I think. Um, yeah, and also a little bit heartbreaking as well, kind of trying to to get those emotions. And and also their relationship, I quite enjoyed their sort of friendship um, that's kind of forged in, in you know, in not very, um, in quite, you know, traumatic circumstances, but they're, they're quite supportive of each other as well. Yeah, it's forged in tragedy. So just to conc- uh, for the audience, Zara's mother's missing, so is Joel's dad. And this is kind of what's binding them together. It's like they're lost souls in a lot of way. And I do love at the same time, Joel feels that the fact that the sergeant cannot find them is wrong. In fact, he states that's his whole job, right? How is he not getting his job right? And it's such an interesting from the gut way of it assessing what should happen. And I feel like it's the voice of somebody who just wants answers and they don't want to take, I can't figure it out. Well, that's your job all day long. Your job is to go figure this out. So why are you not doing your job? And it's a moment, I think, where clarity for these teens, because they're going to see that life can't always be solved. Whereas when you were little, everything got fixed. It either was, it wasn't going to happen or it was going to happen here. It's you, you're in really the ether. And I think that's that's a perfect example of the fact that different characters have different perspectives on things. So, I mean, the teenagers cannot believe that this this police officer, you know, what is he doing all day? Why is he not out there solving these, you know, solving these mysteries? And but then Fork, who is a professional, you know, professional law enforcement um, officer, you know, and he and he has had that professional and life experience to know that answers aren't always forthcoming and he makes the observation to himself that it seems like this cop is actually doing it you know doing a, a reasonable job like he's doing everything that Fork would kind of expect him to do he seems across the details he's um you know he cares about the community and Fork sort of you know um inwardly sort of has a different um you know he meets this, this cop and he, and he thinks you know yes he, he's doing he's doing what what needs to be done really um and and he so he's bringing that more adult professional perspective to it where the teenagers are just like get me the answers <laughs> figure it out figure it out why didn't you get this done why did you and i heard somewhere that um in your research you found out how long it really takes to solve a crime it's not like weeks usually it's usually like it could take a year or years for something to be able to get figured out yeah, absolutely. I spoke to um. So um, Fork is a um in his day job, he is a financial investigator within the federal police. Um, and I spoke to this lovely woman who um who um works in that exact division, the communications department, and offered to sort of talk me through a lot of yeah you know, the work that the um the officers do there. Um, and she was so helpful, and she was so full of kind of um insights. Um, but in terms of from a book, I I. I got almost nothing that I felt I could kind of um, <laughs> use in a, in the short term because um, she was telling me things like the average investigation takes seven years to resolve. And I mean, seven years, I mean, for an adult, that is a long time. For a teenager, that is a lifetime. You're a completely different person in seven years um, and um, and all kinds of things. So I think, yeah, Fork definitely has, he, he definitely brings that kind of awareness um, to the situation. And that awareness is sometimes you know, sometimes things just don't get solved and they don't, um, it, it, it is very hard to, to find um, answers um, in certain situations. And, and this yeah, may, is sort of looking like it may be one of them. Mm-hmm. And now, but also I laugh because in New York, there's crimes. Let's say there's crime in the subway, there's crime on the street and there's so many cameras, which there wouldn't be in this situation. There wouldn't be cameras every place. And I was joking, I think our listeners have heard me say this before. They show somebody what's wearing a mask and they've got a hat down here. And they said, this is the person we're looking for. And the next night they say, we've arrested him. And I'm like, how <laughs> did you figure this out? But somebody like rats out knowing the jacket or the hat or something like that. But it's just really funny. It's like, how do we manage to do this? And then some crimes take forever. 
Like even, I don't know if you heard about these murders that were up in Idaho and the way they trapped this guy with DNA and they chased him along and they found him in his family's home in Pennsylvania. And you're like, that didn't take that long. And everybody's going, oh, it took so long. I'm like, it was probably about six weeks from the time that the you know crime happened. But we're very used to things that take years because you have to put either, I mean, now DNA is something that's completely different because you can actually figure something more out about the person at the crime or whatever. But seven years. Yeah, that would be. But these kids wanted it like that. It's not going to happen. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. That's it. And, and you know, and, and Falk makes the observation, you know, as well in, in this um, in this small town. I mean, yeah, it's not it's not covered by CCTV footage. It actually is the following year when he goes back. The bulk of the action next house takes place a year after Kim has gone missing. So um, which I wanted to do because um, I felt like the you know, there's some stories that are told really well in that kind of urgent immediacy of something happening but some stories I think like this one uh, are better told in that kind of quieter aftermath where people have had a chance to reflect on what's happened and really um you know question their own own role in maybe what they they, they should or shouldn't have done or seen or um or known um and um you know and and the, so when he goes back a year so Kim goes missing and when Fork goes back a year later he does observe there have been some changes so now there are you know more guards at the entrance to this festival and there are more cctv cameras and some of the locals observe it's a little bit of a shame because this was such a is such a family occasion Mm -hmm. um but you know you when something something happens you tend to it changes things you know and it it has changed this whole community you go back on guard you go back on guard and the police detective he was actually the policeman was actually distracted with his own tragedy at the same time as well something that happened with the daughter so as a result that had the you know your life gets jaded when your own life gets in the way of what you're supposed to be doing because you have a tragedy that also is unfolding. So I think that that's something that also everybody is thinking about at the same time. Yeah, that's right. And it, it's, um, it's exactly that, that thing that everybody's bringing their own, their own selves to a situation. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, you know, the, the, that, that ripple effect of, of how far something something tragic can uh, can impact people in all different ways is something that's really interesting to me and I think it throws back to kind of my journalism days when I used to um I used to do a lot of kind of human interest stories and a lot of that involved meeting people um sometimes when something amazing happened this really fantastic life-changing thing but often it was when yeah something um terrible had happened to them and 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 quite often we'd, we'd sort of stay in touch a little bit um and you know at the time I'd be meeting them and I'd just be thinking, you know, I wonder, I wonder what's, you know, your life is going to look like in five years. I mean, I hope, I hope you kind of are able to sort of rebuild in a way that finds you some happiness and finds you some answers and things, because you can see that there, this sort of before and after line mm-hmm. in people's lives when something has happened, it's really just, you know, unseated everything. Um, and that is a, um, it's, it's a big moment. It's a big moment in people's lives and people react differently. Yeah, that before and after, that's a really good, that's a really good thought of everything changes at that instant of what goes on and it radiates across the community. You know, and this happens in a small community where everybody knows each other and you've written small communities like this before. And it's this where you get to know all the people really quickly or a char- cast of characters very quickly. And though I was reading, I feel like I know them. I feel like I actually felt, you know, each of the characters. What do you like about this? And how do you go about developing those characters? I mean, I know you do ending and beginning in advance, but how about the plotting in that middle and the character development? Yeah, I think, um, so one thing I always sort of tell aspiring authors is I think um, the the thing that works for me is um, I I would love to have like a more romantic um, sort of version of this for you, but the, the characters have to be, um, driving the plot and they are kind of functions of the writing in the same way as the language choices or the plot or the setting like they um, it's it's not um, for me it's never been this kind of sense where a character's kind of come to me in the middle of the night and said you know I'm gonna you know I'm gonna guide this story for you the, the characters are there and they are essentially kind of two-dimensional building blocks um, especially the new characters recurring characters not so much but new characters are there to kind of perform a function and um and that's okay I think for a long time and it's certainly like the, the whole sort of first draft and things you were just trying to get them and the planning stages get them to do what they need to do to tell the reader the information the reader is going to know need to know and give them this insight into this community drive the plot forward support the main characters um and it's it's only really once I think I've got that 
them doing what they need to do in the plot that they do start to develop these mm-hmm. these sort of authentic personalities because the more you expose them to situations the more you you know how they would react and you know how they'd react differently to things so you think oh yes he would do this but she would do this. And then that's when, for me, they start becoming real and I start to really connect with them um, because they take on their own little quirks and you 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 get to know how they take their coffee or whether they, you know, what kind of car they drive or whether they speak kindly to their children or, or whatever it is. So um, it's, it, it for aspiring authors, I always do say, like, don't be discouraged if for a, quite a long time your characters do feel a little bit flat. That's fine mm-hmm. as long as they're, serving a purpose and doing some heavy lifting um and give them time to develop that it doesn't have to all come at once Mm -hmm. they don't have to be drinking coffee with milk and two sugars that can happen later absolutely at at the point when someone offers some coffee how do you take it then you can work out how to take their coffee and by that time you'll probably know because you'll have exposed them to all you know you'll already have been to a tragedy with them you know you're gonna you know you're gonna know how to take their coffee by then Right. And it can even be funny because it could be, of course, not coffee, tea, because you've seen Absolutely. that already develop. And that becomes like this recurring kind of line with that person. It's like that Peter Colombo kind of moment. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> or Colombo kind of moment. Um, you talk about this book and I don't want to give anything away, but I'll allude to it just as perception and reality. And it's something for readers to think about. Did you always know that part of the story was going to be there? And I'm hoping I think you know what I'm talking about. But there's yeah, perception and reality. I don't want to give any more away. Yeah, I think so. I, I I think you know a big part of of um this book and all my books is that I I like um you know for me as a reader um I want I want my I want books to make sense at the end and that absolutely goes you know a hundred percent as for me as an author um and part of that is um you know I I I want to give readers that experience of when they get to the end of a book things fall into place that didn't necessarily click at the time and you look back and you think oh my gosh that it was right there. That was why, that was why this happened. You know, this person, this person did this or said this, or I, and I, and I didn't see it at the time, but now I see it. And, and for me, just because as a reader, I love that experience when you feel like, oh, you know, how could I not have seen that? Um, and it takes, yeah. So I, I spent a long time kind of weaving in those sort of the clues in the red herrings. And um, it's a little bit of a leap of faith because, you know, they don't, they don't work on me emotionally as an author. Cause I know the, the reality of the story. Um, but you can kind of take, um, I've got a little bit better with this over time, with, just with the confidence of it, knowing that if you, if you're kind of leading people gently down a path, they will tend to follow you down a path. They won't necessarily go, you know, they won't, their heads won't be turning left and right. They will, they will be trusting you to sort of, um, uh, you know, the, the, with, with what you're showing them, really, um, and it's that it takes a lot of it does take a lot of planning and forethought because I think it's a really definite line between a surprise and a trick, and you always want to fall on the side of surprise. I'd never want the reader to get to the end and think, "Oh, that wasn't that wasn't fair. I couldn't have figured that out." It's I want I want them to look back and think, "Oh, yes, okay, got it. It all <laughs> makes sense." And I and I maybe I should have figured it out. Maybe I could have figured it out. But I do. I don't want you to figure it out. I want you to get to the end and it. Yeah, be revealed. It's like, oh, wait, hold on one second. You know, when did you write the prologue? Was it later or at the beginning? It was it was later. Um, it wasn't the last thing, um, but it was certainly not the first thing. Um, it's that question of thinking, like, where can I where do I join people in? I think I think for this book, maybe possibly more than some of the others, this this was the obvious point to to join at. So that that may maybe made it a little bit easier to know that would be um, yeah, the Kim's disappearance is this sort of the catalyst for what happens next. Um, so, but no, I, I it's 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 not it's certainly not. I don't sit down with like a blank page on day one and <laughs> and write it. I'll be I'll be working out. I I have a really detailed plan. My plan for a, a hundred thousand word book, the plan itself probably runs to forty thousand words, and it's chapter by chapter, um, you know, laid out. And I'll be building it up. Um, kind of as the ideas sort of come to me. So at some points, um, probably mid-range, it would have been obvious to me that that was the point at which to join the action. And I would have sketched out the idea for the prologue. Um, I did spend a long time, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, like pre- debating where where the bulk of the story should be taken. Like, do we do we, do we we join um, the story at Kim's disappearance? And then do we follow through at that point? You know, is the active investigation still ongoing? But I found, and I did plan out that a little bit to see what that would look like, but I just found that 
active question investigation to suck the oxygen out of the room you know there was no space for any other conversations no reflection nobody was talking about anything else and I wanted to give them that opportunity to talk about other things and you know have have sort of quiet moments of just conversation and um you know like um it just be a little bit more um a bit more of a steady pace it's like the layers unravel rather than this frantic yeah. urgent need yeah she's gone we've got to go do this da, da, da. It, didn't, yeah. it didn't go in like that at what point does your agent what point does your editor when do they see this you've got the forty you know, thousand word big you know, outline when do they see it when you're almost done along the way so they see it um yeah and uh, at an agreed day so i have three editors i have um a uk us and australian one and they all see it simultaneously at an agreed um uh agreed date um and that is when i've um i finished i've completely written the full manuscript so they don't they don't know anything really about it until then um they don't see any plans i don't discuss it with them during the draft i, I would give them a hundred thousand words of a complete a full complete manuscript from start to finish. Um, and the reason I do that, I, I work pretty solitary. I don't have any writers groups or anybody else. I just kind of work in it alone. Partly I just find that easier. I find it easier to kind of make my own decisions around it. Um, and partly because um, the reason I keep it from them is because they are, they are such good editors and they're, advice is so valuable that I want to keep them as fresh as possible. Mm -hmm. So you can only read a book for the first time once. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I don't want them to read an unfinished version. I want them to read as close to the point where I feel this is all I can do on it now without outside professional outside, um, you know, a, a feedback. Um, Cause I wanted to know if it works, you know, they are, they are the freshest, most valuable eyes and I want them to read it cold and just have that experience to see if it works. So it's, it's pretty close to finish by the time I, I show it to them, but there's still, I mean, there's still a huge editing process mm -hmm. and there's, there's lots of you know lots of time still to make changes and things but it's at the point where I'm I'm yeah happy with it myself are you surprised sometimes at the things they come back with and just say wait how did I not see that how did I not catch it earlier or is it things that they're just seeing the book differently than you're seeing it yeah it's a bit of both really um I think sometimes there's always useful information there's always useful feedback um I think now we've worked together for five books now and so um, a lot of the stuff that I try not to make the same mistakes twice so a lot of things that um the feedback I got for the first four books you know every single time I try and then do it before they have to say it so <laughs> the feedback I think the feedback becomes even more valuable over time because I'm already uh, you know, I, I'm already doing the stuff that I know they're going to ask for. So then it's a question of, okay, well, what else, what have you seen this time then, you know? And, um, and yeah, there's always stuff. I mean, that's, I think as, um, you know, as you're, you're so embroiled in it that sometimes you, you never really have that benefit of taking a step back from it. And they do have a big kind of, they can see the wood for the trees, you yes. know, um, yes. type situation. So they can always spot like little things like, I mean, it could be anything as small as the fact that there's a number of families in a community that have a similar family structure. Like maybe they have, you know, a, a, a grandparent, a single mother and a young child or something like that. And it, it, I just won't have noticed that they, they do have similar structures and that's something easy to change. And, um, or they'll, they'll find spots that, um, Maybe I'll um, sometimes you, you're so keen to kind of make sure that people have grasped certain elements that maybe you've, they say you don't need to say this so many times. Like mm -hmm. actually we, we, we've, we've got it, you know, you could cut out a number of these and we, we still will understand it. Things like that are quite useful. Um, yeah. But the, I'm, I'm lucky. I've got really good quality editors and they always, the books are always better for having passed through their hands. So that makes for a really good sort of, a lot of trust in a relationship. So um, when you get their comments, do you get different from all three or is there one manuscript that's got, this is what all three said? And um, they combine them. Yeah. Okay. So um, we do, they don't have to, um, they're not obliged to work together, but they do because they're good people and they're professionals mm -hmm. and, you know, it's, it's the easiest way for me to get the notes. So they would, they would read it simultaneously and then they would discuss it among themselves. And then they would, um, then they give me, um, yeah, like a, a, a kind of um, a, a joint, um, kind of joint notes, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, which is, um, yeah, which is useful. But they do, they don't always agree, you know, and they make it clear when they don't. 
Um, and that's that is a question. Yeah, I just that I get to decide. <laughs> <laughs> that's your book again. Your book again. No. Okay. So I cheated because I hadn't read The Dry, and I finally got to watch it adapted on Showtime last week, which was really fun. It was. Um, I said to my husband, "Let's just sit down and watch this." And he's like, "Wow, this character is really good." And I said, "Oh, there are two more books. You know, you can go from there." Um, I heard The Force of Nature is being adapted as well with Eric Banner, who starred in The Dry, returning as Falk. Are they shooting that yet, or where are they? Yeah, they have shot it. I've seen it. It's Ooh. um yeah, it's 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 um yeah, it's it's uh quite far advanced now. Um so they shot it over the Australian winter, which was kind of June, you know, June last year for us. Um and I saw I saw a very rough cut of it. Um it's the same people who did the dry, so I'm glad you enjoyed that. Um Eric Banner was just fantastic as for he um I, yeah he was has been he's so beloved in Australia um and around the world you know and readers have absolutely embraced him which is wonderful um and then um the writer and director is a guy called Robert Connolly who has done exactly yeah you know, the same um for the force of nature and they've got this amazing group force of nature for those who haven't read it it's a it's a story about um five women who go into the kind of deep sort of bushland on a corporate retreat and after a few days only four of them come out and there's there's questions about what happened when they were in the in the bushland for um for those days and um the five women um actors who play these roles are just fantastic like I could not take my eyes off them every time they came on screen I was just what is gonna what's gonna happen now so it was um yeah it's really good I really enjoyed it and um uh so yeah the dry is available on showtime in the US and then watch this space of force of nature it'll be released in australia this year and then hopefully in the us not too long after well i love it i absolutely love it it's, now do they have have they picked up the exiles as well or exiles as well they, or? Uh, they do have the yeah they do have the, the, the sort of the character rights option on that so um so we'll see yeah i mean hopefully um you know ho- hopefully that will be um something that's in there you know in their pipe i know it's certainly on their radar i know they've all read it and um so i think you know hopefully we'll kind of have discussions around that sort of sooner rather than later so do you see the scripts in advance like do you read the scripts in advance for the movies they yeah they do send them to me um yeah um robert connolly um is is a great guy he lives really close to me we work really well together and i think he and i have very similar sort of visions for what's the adaptation which is just is is this lucky that doesn't always happen you know um so yeah he 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 does he does share the scripts with me um and uh, and at the same time I also kind of trust him to to know how to adapt the books on screen Mm -hmm. um he's done you know he's done a great job and um you know so it's sort of uh, yeah it's sort of a mutual kind of trust situation so I, I do read them I don't really offer a lot of feedback on them because I feel like he knows what he's doing and they they are very close to the books so um so yeah so it's it's good I'm really I'm really delighted with it, it's it's such, it's so great working with him I'm really delighted with what he's he's done with them yeah it's nice when the visual image uh, works with the words on the page because often it doesn't yeah. sometimes it doesn't was exiles always the title of the book is it always yeah it was yeah um I although I don't come up with titles that early like I don't really the titles are something I kind of turn my mind to Usually actually after the kind of first, you know, when I'm I'm sort of um quite far down the track. Um I've done at least a couple of drafts and um it's it's a sort of because sometimes the titles take a little while to emerge, you know, within the the stories and you and you try out a few things. But yeah, that's that was the, that was the one that um yeah, that was the one it was, it was always called that for me, and that was the one I put forward to the editors. So let's talk about the cover. So we're definitely, we see the Ferris wheel in the background. I will tell you, even reading the Ferris wheel scenes terrified me of being up here. And <laughs> I was one of these kids who had no fear of heights, but now if you took me, I had my eyes closed the entire time. I, mean, I have to tell you. But so when he was up on top, I was definitely feeling it. So tell us about why this on the cover. Yeah, I mean, the covers are, um, you know, I'm really lucky the cover designers um, in each territory are really great. So it's different covers, actually, um, for different territories. The the This is the, the US cover you've got holding up there, which is beautiful. Um, they've obviously gone for the, you know, the, the food and wine festival um, uh, vibe, which is a, a huge important part of, of the book and where Kim goes missing. Um, so the other territories have, um, yeah, have gone, for, gone for slightly different feels. Like a lot of them have gone for... Um, the Australians gone for for a sort of water. There's a reservoir 
um, mm. which plays a role in the in the book as well. And they've gone for that sort of feel, and the UK have as well, but with slightly different colours. So, um, yeah, it's it's always interesting how people, the designers, sort of pick up different elements. Um, but they each cover is, is um, calibrated for that market. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm lucky that because um, as an author, you don't really have a lot of say in the covers. They tend to. I think they want they want you to like them, obviously, and they consult with you. But you know, it's 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 very much in in their hands. And I'm lucky that I've never had to kind of push back on a cover. I've always loved what they've come up with, and I think that one is just just beautiful as well. And it wraps around the back, and that's what I really yeah. like. The line wraps around the back as well, along with these fabulous quotes about your work. So the audio is narrated by Stephen Shanahan, who's done all your books. And what do you feel about his performance? Really works for your writing. Yeah, he is so great, isn't he? And I always ask um, straight away if I if we can get him, and everybody's always on the same page. Like, yes, we've already we've already called Steve. So um, it's yeah, he's just um, we were just so lucky to get him in the first place. I think he he was just such a good choice by for the original audio, and then that went for the dry, and that went so well, and listeners loved it. They loved his voice and what he brought to it. Um, and then we've been lucky enough that he's you know been agreed, been made himself available to do um, all the others as well um it's just this it's just something about it I think the way he he really um he understands the characters he brings them to life um he, he makes it very clear for the, the listener what's going on um and yeah he's an actor himself so he um so he's able to kind of really I think capture the dialogue so well um I'm just so thrilled I mean yeah re- listeners have um that I get so many compliments about Steve, and I always have to say, I've oh, passed him on. I've passed him on. It's nothing to do with me. It's all, it's all, um, it's all him. The it's 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 him that really makes it. So I'm really happy for him that people have enjoyed it so much. Have you two ever met? Have you ever met Steve in person? Yeah, we have once actually. Yeah, um, uh, we we've been in touch over email quite a bit, but we met um for the third book, The Lost Man. I went up in to Sydney and got to see him um recording some of it, mm-hmm. and then we recorded um a bit of an in conversation with each other um for the audiobook version uh, which was really fun he's just is really cool kind of older like kind of um well when I met him he had kind of slightly longer sort of gray head like sort of look like a surfer dude kind of um feel he's a very cool guy um yeah he's really nice he he actually narrate um did the voice for um uh this, this kid show called Bananas in Pajamas which at the time was my my daughter's favorite show <laughs> so she was like just I mean couldn't quite get her head around the fact that you know I was meeting like B1 for Bananas in Pajamas. <laughs> so um, that <laughs> was a few years you. ago now. But, um, but yeah, but he's, he's a really lovely guy and I'm, I'm really happy that um, listeners have enjoyed him so much. Yeah, now, especially since audio is such a big part of people's reading experience these days. When you have somebody like, oh, I want to go hear him again as much as read your words, it's great. So I have another question from Catherine. She's interested in recommendations for contemporary Australian novelists. Oops, wait one second. Oh, sorry. I'm oh, sorry. Trust me. Sorry. That's, okay. She's interested in recommendations for contemporary Australian novelists that you love. She's really fond of Jessica Anderson and the fabulous Shirley Hazard, neither of one recent or even still alive. And Miles uh, Franklin, My Brilliant Career, and Joan Lindsay, Picnic and Hanging Rock, both of which were turned into famous films. I expect that I suspect that Australian authors are much less known in the U.S. than British, and it's a pity. So, any recommendations? Yeah, I have. Um, I have a couple of really great recommendations. Um, one is um, one of my favorite books from last year. is was a guy by a guy called Benjamin Stevenson, um, who and um, Stevenson with a V, and he wrote um, this great book called um, "Everyone in My Family Has Killed Someone," <laughs> and it's um, it's kind of this super fun fresh take on classic crime it's about this very dysfunctional family um that goes um on a skiing holiday um and get kind of snow in australia and get kind of snowed in and then a body is found and all kinds of skeletons start kind of trooping out of the the, the closets and as as the name suggests this family has got you know, their own sort of secrets they will keep me from each other a little bit and um it's 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 hard to describe the style because it's so fresh and i've never really read anything like it. it's very self-aware take on classic crime but if you like things like say only murders in the building or richard Mm -hmm. osman's novels it's it's for me it's not exactly like them but it had a similar sort of feel to it so benjamin stevenson everyone in my family has killed someone and the other author i always um i love i always recommend is um, a woman called sally hepworth who is Mm -hmm. actually touring the state she's coming i think in april so keep an eye out um 
that she writes these really great, like fun domestic noir sort of um you know like women with beautiful kitchens and terrible secrets you know and um it, it's that kind of thing and they will send Bayside um Bayside Melbourne actually which is where she and I both live which is kind of fun um but her she had um her, her most, second most recent one was called The Younger Wife which is about two sisters whose dad marries a woman essentially their own age and a kind of tension of fallouts of that and um, then her most recent one is called A Soulmate, which is um, about a family who buy this beautiful sort of clifftop house and very quickly, this is based on actually a, sort of a bit of a true um, true story in Australia, but um, a, the um, very quickly they realise it's actually a, a bit of a notorious suicide spot and people are jumping from these cliffs. And the, the husband and his family sort of ends up taking on this kind of role of going out and like talking them down and he succeeds for the first six and then the seventh one, he doesn't manage to save her. And it's about this sort of, this kind of, again, the fallout and the, the, you know, the relationships between you know, what, what was, you know, what was she there for and all kinds of things. So um, it's a really, yeah, so Sally Hepworth, <laughs> um, she's a great, yeah, she's a great read and she is coming to the States yeah, soon. So um, she's, she's so fun in person as well. She's the most fun person to talk to. You, you would, um, you have a great evening if you catch up with her. And your fun is following her on social media. So yeah, I'm catching you on the last day of your U.S. tour. So what it's like being back on the road in the States after a few years of lockdown and only doing this? <laughs> yeah, uh, look, it's been great. I mean, it has been a few years. I mean, my my last book, The Survivors, came out. It, I was entirely locked down the whole time. So everything was on Zoom. So thank you so much to, to you and everyone else who did, um, you know, make the effort to catch up with me over Zoom and, and things because it was um, – it really meant a lot to to have that opportunity. Um, nothing really beats going out in person, though. I think you know, and actually being face to face with the readers, and be able to sign the books, and getting to see these cool bookshops, and um, so yeah, it's been it's been a real joy. And um, thanks to everybody who's come along to one of the events. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, it's just before you get on your long flight back home. I feel like I'm yeah, catching right. up. So, what's next for you besides the long flight back home? <laughs> Yeah, so I guess, um, yeah, the Force of Nature film will come out in Australia this year. So that kind of keeps me a little bit busy with, um, uh, you know, it, gives, it always gives the books a bit of a resurgence, so which is, which is great. Um, and then I'll be turning my mind soon to the the next book, which um, I'm still, um, I'm not just being coy, I'm still trying to make decisions on, really. It'll be another Australian mystery, no, you know, absolutely. I guess so, obviously, a standalone with that being the end of the Fork series. Um so um yeah I'm kind of weighing up a few ideas around that so yeah watch your space on that one you have a long flight home to work on that you have the long I flight do, home yeah. to <laughs> lots, lots of thinking time <laughs> I do my best thinking on airplanes and I missed you being on airplanes because that's when I got the most done fly to California five hours fantastic time Jane as always it has been so nice to be able to talk to you catch up I'm glad I got to read this book and got to watch the movie in between because last time I was dying to be able to do that and to be able to put your work in that context as well. Enormously fun. Oh, Carol, thank you so much. And and thank you for, um, yeah, thank you for, for sort of being so supportive of the books and for introducing me to all your, you know, all your followers. And um, yeah, it's, it's always so great to chat to you as, as it was this time as always. And to our readers, look forward to seeing you next time, whether it's watching us or listening to us on our podcast. Um, we always enjoy talking to readers like Jane, and we hope you enjoy listening as much as we do. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you.